Overclocking is tweaking your PC to maximise its performance. But when you do this, you have to ensure you have adequate cooling. With the help of the best overclockers in Australia, we'll be looking at some extreme cooling systems over the next few weeks. So you've got Dino here. Welcome to Good Game. Thanks. Uh, Dino's speciality is water cooling. So, um, what exactly is water cooling? Well, water cooling is a form of um, a computer component cooling, which uses water as its main ingredient. So, what components do you need? There's um, a water block. It's made out of copper because copper is one of the best materials to translate heat. This is where the tubes go. You need a radiator, which uh, cools the water. You need a reservoir and a water pump, which pumps the water through, and obviously some coolant as well. So how does it cool the system down? What happens is you've got a very hot uh, processor underneath. It heats up the copper. The water travels through these loops, and this heat is transferred onto the block, and the water cools it down. The way it cools it down is it actually goes to a radiator through which uh, the water passes. The air cools those channels, circulates back into the block, and voila, you've got a cooling system, that's how it cools it down. So are there any risks associated with water cooling? Uh, yes, there are, but I personally think uh, if you're careful, uh, you won't really run into those if you have good preparation. You need to make sure that all the tubing is correctly seated, uh, clamped uh, together. The system has to be tested outside uh, of the case just for water leaking, just in case it leaks. If it does leak, uh, you could pretty much kill your $1,000 CPU and you know $1,000 graphics card. So you have to be very careful how you do that. In the scale of things, is it the most effective cooling system? The advantage of water cooling is that it doesn't need much maintenance once you've actually installed it. So a water cooling would cool a very hot processor or a, or a very high overclock. And to run a system at 24-7 settings, so normal day-to-day -day sort of stuff, games, it's very good. Uh, however, if you are an extreme overclocker uh, and you're going for, you know, world records and things like that, there are more effective ways to cool a, a computer system and water cooling won't be able to do that and you need to go below zero. Hi Kale, welcome to Good Game. Uh, so you're a phase change cooling expert. What exactly is phase change cooling? What happens is there's a compressor which pumps refrigerant around the system and it basically pumps uh, liquid refrigerant first to the head, the copper block on top of the CPU. And as the heat, the heat on the CPU heats the head, it boils off the liquid and it changes state from a liquid state to a gaseous state, which is a vapour state. So it's actually like having a fridge attached to your computer? Yeah, basically that's it. Um, instead of having a big fridge, it's just cooling something which is like the size of an apple. It sounds pretty complicated. Would you advise a home user to give it a try? Normally I'd recommend people to start off with maybe water cooling or air cooling. And once they become more familiar with the hardware, they can move on to a more stronger cooler. So what kind of overclock can you achieve with a phase change cooler? With processors, um, to make them go faster, you need to give them more power. And as you go faster, they produce a lot more heat. Um, the sort of power that they run on these, without phase change, the CPU would hit over 100 degrees and burn and blow up. Uh, so with, with the, the cooling and the higher power, uh, a CPU that would normally do 3.6 on water would now go to 4.2 or 4.5 gigahertz. The advantage is that a cheap CPU can go as fast as the best CPU around for a third of the price. So when you go below zero, isn't condensation a problem? Uh, yes. Normally when you freeze something, uh, obviously white frost will form everywhere and when it when you turn the PC off, that frost is going to turn to water and blow up your computer. So the deal with condensation, we have a few different methods in which we work together. We have these insulation gaskets which go on top of the motherboard and they insulate around the socket so that the cold surfaces aren't exposed to the air and gather frost on top of them. On the back of the CPU, we put just a normal grease compound and you sort of smear it over the back of the CPU so if any condensation was to form, it stops from getting in contact with the electronics. Well, Kyle, thanks for showing us your phase change cooling system and good luck. Cool. Thanks for having me down here. Hi, Slydog. Welcome to Good Game. Um, quite a system you've got here. Do you want to talk us through it? 
Basically, it's just a um, copper tube with a bit of a mounting bracket and insulation, and it basically straps to the top of the CPU and uses the dry ice to cool it down to about minus 78. So this isn't a system for a normal home user then, is it? No, no, not at all. Basically, you have to keep it upright, so putting it in a case sideways mounted is just out of the question. You can get a build-up of condensation, and um, plus operating at such extreme voltages and temperatures, you can definitely risk losing your CPU and your motherboard, so it's not for the faint-hearted. So why on earth would you do something like this? With dry ice, you can pretty much get to some of the top overclocks in the world just with a simple copper tube and a couple of dollars worth of dry ice, so with a little effort you can get quite a lot of results out of it. So is dry ice safe to handle? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it is it's it is very cold, it's about minus 78, um, but as long as you use a cup to pour it in and don't go handling it too much, you should be right. Uh, it is compressed carbon dioxide though, so um, it can evaporate off and build up, so you've got to be careful of doing it in well-ventilated places. So what on earth have you got here? This is a liquid nitrogen dewa. Fill it up with about 20 litres of liquid nitrogen and you're good to go. So what does liquid nitrogen do for you? Uh, it's very cold. I mean, basically you've got your dry ice, which is about minus 78, but if you want to go for the really extreme clocks, you need to sort of get onto the liquid nitrogen, which is about minus 196 degrees. So do you need a licence or something to handle it? Uh, no, really all you need is a um, certified dewa, which is the liquid nitrogen storage container and a safe way to transport it. You can't really transport it in the car, in a vehicle, inside a closed space. So what kind of performance can you expect out of an extreme cooling system like this? Uh, with dry ice, like for a Core 2 Duo, you could probably get it to about four to four and a half. Um, liquid nitrogen, you'd, you could push it past five to five and a half gigahertz, so up there with the fastest in the world. Man, that's quick. Now, the guys are going to work together to try and attempt to go for the single and quad-core world overclocking records. All right, let's begin. Your whole system runs at what's called a clock. So every second it ticks, it sends a pulse through. And so in order to get the process up to a f faster speed, rather than running at the speed of the board, which in this case, say it runs at 200 megahertz, for example, but that would make the processor too slow. So if you had a multiplier, say, 2, and instead of running 200 times a second, it would go up to 400 times a second. So it's just basically a way of getting that CPU to run faster than all the other components in the system. Well, the idea is to, to pre-test everything on, on air cooling, so you know the hardware's limits. So I know roughly where, how hard I can push it without having any hardware issues. When you're benchmarking this, you should know what your hardware is capable of and what you, roughly what you can expect. Oh, there's a cold one already. Locked up already. It's locked up. Which means, which means they cold. start the process again. Yeah. There are all sorts of protections these days, so once you hit a certain temperature, um, it, it'll just shut the machine down. Whereas in, in the past, yeah, there was a real big risk of destroying all your hardware. The risk is still there today, but it's greatly reduced compared to what it was like in the past. Is 165 is 165. Okay. So why are you adding water into the system at the moment? They can quite often cold bug, so if you put a bit of water in, it's a really good insulator and it stops it from reaching quite as cold you know, w where it will lock up. So you just just puts a bit of a barrier between the, um, the liquid nitrogen, the copper tube, and the CPU. So you've already surpassed the, the goal of 4.5, and you're, oh, you're yeah. off and away. Yeah, the fastest I've ever had one mine was 4.6. We just had almost 4.8. But we'll get five gigahertz now. As long as these temps stay. Don't get it too cold. Please. No, this is good, yeah. He's got to keep it going. Otherwise, yeah. if he's got too big a jump in Plus, temperatures. You generally um, try oh, yeah. increase the front side bus speed yeah. in Windows, and that basically it allows you to gradually bump it up without having to reboot and reboot and go back into BIOS, change the setting and reboot. So it just gives you a better idea of what, what overclock you can get. When you so what sort of clock speed are we at now? 4 8. Making progress. We need more LN2 quick too. Yeah, we got yeah, yeah, I need some more LN2. Guys, guys. So you're bypassing essentially all the Four software nine. on the board and doing uh, it yourself. Now go. <laughs> 1.8, that's insane. 4955, <laughs> screenshot. Wait, can't see the screen. Oh. Oh, yes, that is. <laughs> is that? What's that? It's just under five. five. Yeah, we've got it.